If you look at some of the most infamous murderers in the world, the majority of them are men, but some of the most evil crimes in history have been committed by women. So here we have five that not only shocked the world, but were also incredibly brutal. Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. This is the rhyme associated with Lizzie Borden, who was tried and acquitted of murdering her father and stepmother at their home. Now most of you paranormal fans have probably heard of her due to the ghostly activity and investigations taken place at her home. Lizzie lived in a house in Fall River, Massachusetts with a wealthy father and stepmother as her own mother had died when she was just two years old. Lizzie absolutely hated her stepmother and refused to eat at the same table, speaking to her only when she had to. Her hatred towards her grew when her father bought her stepmother's sister's house to save her from eviction. Lizzie believed this was proof they were all after her father's money, so she ransacked her stepmom's room and stole her jewellery and watches. There is one single act that is believed to have tipped Lizzie over the edge, and that was when her father killed her pigeons she kept at the bottom of the garden. He was fed up with people trying to steal them, so killed them. Lizzie was left devastated, and it was after this there were reports she attempted to buy prussic acid, a deadly poison that was refused to her by several chemists. On a scorching hot day on the 4th of August 1892, Lizzie's father, her stepmother and their maid were all taken ill after eating. Strangely, Lizzie was the only one in the house who was not affected. The maid felt so poorly that she went to bed in the attic, and about 10 minutes later she heard Lizzie frantically screaming, father's dead. She rushed to see what was going on, but Lizzie would not allow the maid to see her father's body, but told her to get a doctor. When the doctor arrived, he saw the father slumped on the sofa with the walls and floor covered in blood. He had been violently axed at least 10 times in the head. Lizzie was asked where her stepmother was and she replied that she thought she had gone to visit a friend, but she may have returned and could have also been killed. When neighbours arrived and went upstairs to look for Mrs Borden, she too was found dead with 18 hatchet wounds to the head. Lizzie was a prime suspect, and at the inquest into her parents' death, she changed her story several times, eventually leading to her arrest. At the trial, Lizzie gained support from the public by appearing a sweet, God-loving woman, and despite the enormous evidence pointing to her being the only possible murderer, such as her burning a dress thought to be stained with blood, trying to buy the poison, and the fact a hatchet was found in the basement that had been cleaned and had its handle broken, the jury bought into the innocent sweet woman who appeared before them, and she was acquitted. Lizzie lived out her days a very wealthy woman from her father's inheritance, but was never accepted at her neighbourhood as everyone was more than confident she was the killer. You can actually stay the night in what's said to be one of the most notorious crime scenes in American history. Even able to stay in the room, Lizzie's stepmother was found dead. And not just that, but the house is a popular place for paranormal fans due to its current haunted reputation and believed evil presence. Mary Bell Mary Bell is a British woman who murdered two little boys in Scotswood, Newcastle upon Tyne in 1968. Mary Flora Bell was a dark-haired, intelligent and quick-thinking child, but she came from a troubled family. Her mother was uncaring and was often in hospital due to psychiatric problems. Mary was often sexually abused and her mother even tried to give her away when she was three years old and attempted to kill her on more than one occasion. Her troubled upbringing took its toll, and Mary's first evil act is thought to be pushing a three-year-old boy from an air raid shelter. The boy was severely injured, but the incident was written off as accidental. When Mary was just 11 years old, the killings began. Two boys stumbled upon the body of four-year-old Martin Brown in an abandoned house on May the 25th, 1968. It was established that Martin had been strangled, and on the 31st of July that same year, another body was found. Three-year-old Brian Howe was discovered and showed signs that he had also been strangled. It's believed Mary's older friend, 13-year-old Norma, was with her during the murders of both boys and had carved the letter N into Brian's stomach. This was later changed to an M, thought to be by Mary who had returned to the body. Police launched a major hunt, questioning local families and a number of children. Eventually, fibres from Mary Bell and her unrelated friend Norma Bell's clothes linked the girls to both murders. With further questioning, the girls started to blame each other for the killings. On the 5th of December 1968, the two girls stood trial in Newcastle for the evil murders of Martin Brown and Brian Howe. At the trial, the prosecution concluded that although younger than her friend Norma, it was Mary who had the dominant personality and was far more intelligent and dangerous than 13-year-old Norma. Mary said the murders had been committed entirely for excitement and pleasure. 
During the trial, the girls continued to blame each other, but the damning evidence from one father who claimed Mary had tried to strangle his child sealed her fate. The jury found Mary not guilty of murder by reason of diminished responsibility, but guilty of manslaughter. They accepted that Norma was completely under the influence of Mary and found her not guilty. Mary was released in 1980 after serving 12 years in prison. She has gone on to have a child of her own and in 1998, Mary gave an account of her life in a book called Cries Unheard, blaming the abuse she suffered from her mother as a child as a major factor in her compulsion to kill. To this day, the two murders taken place by 11-year-old Mary Bell's bare hands are two of the most infamous and cold-blooded killings in female history. On the afternoon of the 29th of November 1987, Korean Air Flight 858 between Baghdad, Iraq and Seoul, South Korea exploded over the Andaman Sea. All 115 passengers and crew on board were killed, most of them were South Koreans. Right from the start, sabotage was suspected, with the chief suspect being North Korean agents as part of the ongoing feud between North and South Korea. Kim Hun Hee and her elderly companion Kim Sung departed Flight 858 at Abu Dhabi flying from Baghdad. They had no luggage and were flying a roundabout route to Bahrain. Kim was using a fake passport under the name of a Japanese woman and Kim Sung was posing as her father. As they disembarked the plane, they left behind a plastic bag containing liquid explosives and an explosive device. After the crash, these two became prime suspects. They were briefly questioned while further investigations were being carried out and were released. At this point, the pair knew they had been rumbled and planned to make their escape by flying to Rome, but they were arrested at the airport. The two agents knew this was the end of the road, so they both attempted to take the cyanide capsules they had hidden in a cigarette. Kim Sung died immediately, but Kim was stopped before she managed to take the full dose. Kim woke up in hospital full of hatred for herself, as she felt she had betrayed her country. As a child, Kim was taught to hate South Korea and her loyalty and devotion to North Korea was rewarded when she was chosen to be an agent. After seven years of intense training, Kim was chosen for the bomb mission and believed to be completely brainwashed at this point, she was proud to accept. After her arrest, she was taken to South Korea and was absolutely distraught. This was the worst thing that could happen to her. She desperately tried to bite her own tongue off so she could not speak, but this failed so she refused to eat. Eventually she confessed and South Korea set about deprogramming their captive. She was put on trial and sentenced to death, but was later pardoned on the grounds she had been completely brainwashed and was not responsible for her actions. Kim is now theoretically free, although for her own safety she remains under the protection of the authorities. She is regarded as a traitor in North Korea and is on their death list. Kim has since shown complete remorse for blowing up flight 858 and has donated generously to the families, although this will never compensate for the 115 innocent people who lost their lives that day. Myra Hindley Just the name Myra Hindley represents horror and outrage. The image of a blonde woman with evil deep-set black-rimmed eyes who was responsible for one of the most heinous crimes in history, the Moore's murders. Even today, Myra Hindley is characterised by the press as being the most evil woman in Britain. Myra Hindley was a devout Roman Catholic. She loved dancing and swimming and was a well-liked lady. Then in 1961, all that changed when she met Ian Brady. Immediately, her family noticed a change. She stopped going to church and became secretive and erratic. Brady completely dominated her and before long, she was under his dark spell. He encouraged Myra to entice children into his car as they would more likely trust a lady and then the pure evil would begin. They would torture their victims before burying them at Saddleworth Moor in Yorkshire. And to add to their horrendous crimes, they photographed and recorded many of their victims being tortured. It all started when 12-year-old John Kilbride and 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey went missing. At first, nobody linked the disappearances to the pair, but this all changed when the murderous couple involved Myra's brother-in-law, David Smith. David witnessed Ian Brady hacking a young man to death in his front room. Myra and Brady acted as if it was completely normal, asking David to help them move the body before making a cup of tea. After David left the house in a complete daze and shocked at what he had witnessed, it was only a few hours later when he was unable to live with what he had seen and went to the police. Myra and Brady were arrested and the full horror of their crimes was discovered. The victim was named as 17-year-old Edward Evans. After searching the house and Myra's car, the horrific photographs and recordings were found. One of these was of little Leslie Ann Downey, gagged and terrified, with heartbreaking recordings of her calling for her mother and pleading not to be hurt. 
Myra was found guilty of two murders and of harbouring and assisting in the murder of John Kilbride and was thankfully sentenced to life in prison. In 1987, in a bid to win her freedom, Myra admitted to knowledge of the killing of 12-year-old Keith Bennett, who disappeared in 1964, and 16-year-old Pauline Reed, missing since 1963. Myra even took police to where Huron Brady had buried Pauline on Saddleworth Moor and her body was recovered. But despite repeated attempts by his family and police, Keith Bennett's body has never been recovered. Myra spent the rest of her life in jail and despite several attempts to win parole, she died in prison in 2002, age 60. Catherine Knight Catherine Knight's crime is so horrific it's not often talked about. It was even kept from being published in the Australian newspaper as it was said people could not stomach the details. An Australian journalist said, We had to make a decision whether the story was suitable for people to read with their breakfast in the morning, and the decision was made this couldn't be reported. It was too horrific. On March the 1st, 2000, police entered a house in the tiny Australian town of Aberdeen, and what they discovered has haunted them for the rest of their lives. In a pot full of potatoes and vegetables was the roasted head of John Price. As they searched the property, they found Price's skin dangling from a nail in an archway. It had been so skillfully removed from his body that only a few shards of skin remained on his toes, fingertips and a scar on his chest. Placed on the floor next to the hanging skin was Price's skinned torso, arms and legs, and it's believed what was left of his body was sat in an armchair. In the kitchen they found two dishes of stew containing baked vegetables and Price's chopped up buttocks. Knight had served these up to feed Price's two children, and a third bowl was found thrown outside on the lawn. Many believe this bowl was the murderer's failed attempt at eating her own portion. Police didn't have to look far for the person responsible for this horrific scene. It was Price's girlfriend, Catherine Mary Knight. Knight came from a shambolic family. She grew up witnessing drinking, violence and suicide. And by the time she went to high school, she was already notoriously wild and violent. She dropped out of school at 16 and worked in a slaughterhouse. And this is where she learned her expert butchering skills. By 1983, she had two daughters and a failed marriage. After a couple more violent affairs and a further two more children, Knight met John Price. They endured a stormy and violent on-off relationship for five years, until Price, after a particularly violent argument with Knight involving a knife, got a restraining order to keep her away from him and his two children. It was reported that Price had jokingly told friends after leaving work on February the 29th, 2000, that if he was not in work the next day, it was probably because Knight had murdered him, and obviously Price failed to show up at work the next day. Catherine had entered the house that night, lured John into bed, and when he drifted off to sleep, got out her knives. When police arrived the next day, they discovered her fast asleep and she was arrested and eventually pleaded guilty of murder, although she has always said that she remembers nothing about the killing. In 2006, Knight appealed the sentence, saying it was too harsh, but this was quickly rejected by the judge. Catherine Knight is currently detained in Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre in Australia, and her actions have gone down as one of the most gruesome murders by a female in history. So that's five incredibly evil women who have killed. We should all take the time to consider those who lost their life under these terrible circumstances. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and see you again for another one.